a nuisance. Um, it could also have been painful, uh, depending where they stuck to you. Um, but we don't normally see these things as an opportunity. The Mestral did. So he began to investigate them and began to see that, they, that the burrs had little hooks. Um, and these little hooks would stick to things that happened to have little loops, such as fabric on, on trousers. And so he replicated that system. On the left, you see these artificial little hooks that were made out of plastic, microscopic size, by the way, not as big as you see them there. And on the right, you see the loops created by fabric. And that's the story of Velcro. That's how de Mestrade came along and created um, Velcro um, as something that all of you know uh, um, for sure. I mean, I've got Velcro on my, on my watch here. Uh, on the watch band itself, there is a version of Velcro. And we use it in so many areas. And what de Mestrade did is classical um, biomim biomimicry, that is looking at the system in nature and replicating it in such a way that we can use it as an everyday product. In case anybody's wondering where that name came from, because names of products are rather important. We know that sometimes um, companies come up with names that uh, don't make very much sense. In fact, sometimes products uh, don't make any sense at all, become almost negative. Uh, I'm going to digress here. I tend to do that regularly. General Motors did that once in, um, in Latin America when they began selling a car uh, that we know up here uh, called the Nova. Except in Spanish, Nova means no go. And so that is not a very successful naming strategy. Anyways, the Velcro comes from the combination of velour, which is the cloth part of it, the loop part, and crochet, which is hook, uh, both are French words. Uh, and so you combine the word velour and crochet and you get Velcro. Now, um, I'm gonna go back to what I was saying before. Be honest with me now, how many of you, when you first had a Toya ball encounter, found it an opportunity to think out of the box and come up with some kind of wonderful idea on which you could make a multi-million dollar business. And I think if you're honest, much like when I had my first Choya Ball uh, encounter, the last thing on my mind was a business opportunity. It was, how do I get this Choya Ball off my hand? Now, there are other examples of uh, biomimicry. Velcro is certainly uh, one, one of the better ones. Um, let me share a few of these. I'm just showing you here some pictures of how Velcro works, of course, if you were to put it under a, a microscope. Uh, and then they've done all kinds of variations on, on that Velcro theme. So biomimicry is the design process that mimics systems found in nature in order to create artificial ones. So we're looking at a system in nature, not what nature looks like, but what the system is, in order to make something ourselves that we can use. I'm, I'll, I'll share three of them with you now. Um, sharks have very have, have, uh, phenomenal um, hydrodynamic properties because of their skin. Uh, that's in part why they're able to uh, swim as fast as, as, as they do. It's not only the fact that they are very powerful, but they have this very slippery kind of skin. And if you look at the skin under a microscope, you have these overlapping scales. And it's what creates this ability for it to go through water as rapidly as it does. Well, a fabric was created. And you can see, I think it's Michael Phelps on the right-hand side, wearing a swimsuit. Um, Speedo came out with that swimsuit. And it did increase a, a swimmer's um, the time, it, it would decrease, in fact, the time, increase the speed at which a swimmer could, could go. Uh, from what I've heard, they were banned at the uh, Olympics as giving an unfair, um, unfair advantage to, to a swimmer. But again, it's the idea of looking at nature, 
something in nature that swims very, very quickly. And how can I mimic that in order to create the same kind of properties? Um, so here we have the shark on, of course, the left-hand side and the swimmer on the right-hand side. Um, there are some wind turbines that have been inspired by the whale fin design. And these have increased um, the lift by 8% and decreased drag by 32%. So here on the left, you can see a humpback whale and you can see those knobs on its front fins and those knob shapes have been replicated on the edge of the blade of these wind turbines. So again, looking at a system within nature, now in this case, they resemble physically, visually, the, um, the, um, um, the fins of the whale, but they're being used because the fins of the whale is part of the swimming system that the whale has. And so that system that allows the whale to do what it does um, makes it do, uh, makes these wind turbines much more efficient. And let's look at a third one. Um, this one it has to do with the high-speed trains in Japan. Now, the story of this one is a fascinating one because the chief engineer of the railway company that designed and made these trains happened to be a birder and was fascinating by birds. And on weekends or whenever he had time, he would go and observe birds. And he observed one day the kingfisher diving. And if you've ever seen a kingfisher dive, it is quite phenomenal. It's almost like one of those perfect dives that they do in the Olympic Games where there is no splash. The diver goes in and you can barely see a bubble. Uh, kingfishers do this on, on, on a regular basis. And the reason why this was important from an engineering point of view is that when trains go through a tunnel, and especially when two trains are going through the tunnel in opposite directions, they create a sonic boom. And the sonic boom is created by the compression of air as these two trains, they're like pistons in a way um, in a cylinder and they compress the air. And so the idea is to try to reduce that so that they reduces what's called the aerodynamic noise. And so if you look at the front end of this train on the left-hand side, you can see the sharp, very smooth bullet. And then if you look on the right-hand side at the kingfisher, you can see that same kind of profile. So the profile is done because for the kingfisher, it reduces drag and allows it to dive to catch fish. In the case of the train, it allows it to go faster. So the train, for some people, they may look at it and say, whoa, that's a cool looking train. That so, looks so fast and smooth. But that look is not simply a visual attribute. Um, it is there because it functions better that way, much like it functions better for the kingfisher. Now, there are skeptics in my audience, I am sure, and they're saying, yeah, yeah, Jacques, come on. Uh, humans have been using nature as a source for design forever. Um, what you have in front of you there is um, uh, a diagram of Walnut Canyon. I'm sure some of you have been to Walnut Canyon up in uh, the Flagstaff area, just east of Flagstaff. And you can see that the um, uh, Sinawa uh, native people basically use found stone and found mortar, wood, whatever, to create a habitat. Well, that's not biomimicry. They're just finding materials that are appropriate for a certain need and using it. Um, there, there are other areas within design and architecture that somewhat resemble what we, we would call biomimicry. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright was known uh, for organic architecture or organic design. And if you go to Taliesin West, as I'm sure many of you have, you'll see in his buildings a use of stone similar to what is found in the Sonoran Desert. So what he does is that he creates a building that is one with nature. That is, it seems to be growing out of nature. It's not an imposition of a style that is not of the place. So for example, 
um, sometimes you'll find a building that may be on its own beautiful, but it seems so out of place because the place does not really allow it to fit in well. It seems to be, um, um, what, what can I say here? Uh, it's not meant for that place. Uh, it seems to be out of place. Like, what is it doing here? Whereas if for Frank Lloyd Wright, when you look at his building at Tellius and West, it's using stone, it's using concrete, which is somewhat similar to the dirt that is uh, um, around. It's low, uh, whatever, but that's organic design. That's not biomimicry. He's not borrowing a system. He's just using some of the materials and having a respect for the place so that his building does not seem to be out of place. So he's making it one with, with the place. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright had many students, but one of these students was Paolo Soleri. And Paolo Soleri um, um, designed around a, a concept that also brought in nature, uh, but brought in nature in a slightly different way, another way that we would consider to be biomimicry. Um, he had a concept that we referred to as arcology. And arcology is a combination of two words, the words architecture and ecology. And what Solari was about uh, with arcology was that you could, he basically was saying, you cannot divorce architecture from the place it's at or its ecology. It's part of the ecology. And therefore you've got to build in combination. So Arcosanti is a perfect example of that, not only in the shape of the buildings that are there, but the fact that I believe he has a section of land, uh, 600 and some odd acres. And his concept was that you don't take 600 acres and then build, you know, divide it into one acre lots uh, leave a green space somewhere, and then put a house on each lot. The idea is to use nature as a source for things like food, um, for things like growth of trees, in order to have bees and animals, in order to be one with the ecology, not to be apart from the ecology. And so arcology was the melding of architecture and ecology in one. Now, I know that when you visit um, Arcosanti and you see people living in what resembles at times almost a beehive, that seems to be contrary to the way that we live in, um, in Scottsdale and Chandler and wherever. Uh, but it's the kind of attitude and ideology that uh, Paolo Solari had as where a building should be situated with respect to the land that it's on. Now we also have another area where you could say that it's biomimicry, um, an area that um, uh, you know people like Bernie uh, uh, teach extremely well, and that's uh, ethnobotany. That is the use of plants for medicinal or other uh, similar purposes. And then that, that, that's fine. There's nothing there that is wrong with that. I mean, we know that native people have been using plants in the desert for a long time uh, for properties that these, these plants have, and that's fine. But that's not biomimicry, that's ethnobotany, and uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, the um, ho uh, jojoba um, uh, fruit and the, the, the nut that it, it creates and how it can be used um, um, to uh, ease things like, I, I believe things like burns or sunburn or or actual burns caused by, by fire. So you spend a lot of time in the Sonoran Desert. Could you go through the Sonoran Desert and see and uh, look at the possibilities for some of the plants that are there, some of um, the animals that live there that could create um, inspiration for a biomimicry concept? And here I'm not saying that the concepts I'm going to share with you were created because somebody hiked through the Sonoran Desert. But you can see how we're not divorced from what nature does. And in many cases, nature does it better than, than we do. So here's a plant that many of you are familiar with, the Ocotillo. 
Again, something, you know, a plant you don't want to be grabbing anytime soon. And you can see all of those spikes there. But native people knew that um, as much of a nuisance that those spikes are, that they can also benefit. Uh, and if you go to the desert botanical gardens on the left-hand side, you'll see a typical, what would have been a typical native garden. And the ocotillo is used there as a kind of barbed wire fence. And you can take a stick of ocotillo, you can put it in the ground, and not only will it provide a barrier because of the thorns, it will actually grow. And so now you've got a living fence and a fence that uh, will be there for a long time. And certainly the concept in, in, in the West on ranches and that, well, in the East as well, uh, of barbed wire is the same concept. Um, you know, it's the idea of something, in this case, wire with barbs on it that allow um, cattle to remain in one enclosed area. So from an ocotillo, which is a plant that has barbs, to um, the light bulb going on for indigenous people to use it, that it could be used even though it, it, would, it would hurt if you, if you held it. And I'm sure some of you have come into contact with an ocotillo plant, but you can use it as a form of barbed wire. Um, we have the um, saguaro, and I'm sure all of you as stewards know the difference between that and a barrel cactus, that the saguaro can grow to be 40 feet high or more, whereas the barrel, what, six feet? And the reason principally, I'm gonna digress here for a second. The thing that's difficult about doing a lecture like this um, on Zoom is that when I would lecture at the university or even when I did some talks with the, with the conservancy is I would engage the audience, you know, get in among the audience and get them to answer questions, whatever. Now I'm in this room, all of you are on mute. I might as well be talking to myself, but uh, we will move on. Um, what you've got here in the saguaro are these hey, ribs. You are you lonely? I'll talk to you. Talk to Jacques. <laughs> I'm here. I'm your friend. Anyone else that want to talk to Jacques? I, um, miss, the, I miss the interaction too. And that's, I do, yeah, Jacques. Yeah, yeah. Sincerely, so, okay. I miss it. Uh, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll just move on and then we'll open up the mics and, 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 and get at it. Anyway, all of you as stewards would know by now, and if you don't, you should, um, that the big difference is that the uh, saguaro has ribs, which allows them to grow as tall as they are, whereas the, um, the barrel cactus doesn't. And, and the barrel cactus gets up to a certain height and it just can't, it, it would just topple over. It doesn't have structural strength. So it's got the, um, the compressive strength of the gelatinous material that's in it that, that, that makes it what, 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 uh, what it is. The saguaro has that as well, but saguaro has ribs and allow, allows it to go up. So there on the left is a dead saguaro and you can see the ribs. Well, in engineering construction and civil engineering, such as these tall uh, posts, you've got concrete which has good, very good compressive strength, but has got um, terrible um, properties when it comes to tensile strength. And so what you do to compensate is put reinforcement bars or as they're commonly known as rebars. And you, what you're doing is mimicking what swarrows have been doing for millions of years. So we may think that as engineers that we are very bright and intelligent uh, nature's been doing it for a long time. And maybe we could be a little bit more humble at times and just begin to observe nature a little bit more closely and find out how does nature do it? And can we learn from nature uh, to, make it, to make it better? Um, teddy bear choya. Now we talked about the, the choya ball, um, which uh, most of us would not perceive to be uh, a very pleasant experience if we were to get one. But let me go one step further and talk about the choya from another point of view, and that is its skeleton. Its skeleton, as you can see it uh, on the left there, that's a fallen uh, choya. 
uh, has got this lattice structure. On the right, what you see is the interior of the S.C. Johnson building, also designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright wanted in the building this large open space area that, that, that you see. And the building codes were such in, um, in Wisconsin that the columns would have had to have been about six feet in diameter. And he thought those were too imposing, that that just was just too massive uh, in that space. And because of his experience in Arizona, he began to look at the Choya lattice structure that you see um, on the left. Because if I go back to the previous photograph, you know that choyas can be rather tall and they hold this mass up on top. So what if he replicated that? What if he did a lattice structure of steel on the inside of the columns and then pour the concrete around it? And he did, and it met the building codes. And so there is using the biomimicry nature of the Choya structure into an artificial structure of the columns in this large building. And to continue a little bit about buildings and habitats, um, we have the infamous pack rat. Uh, in, all, in my many years of hiking the, the uh, preserve, I never saw one. Um, I have to believe that whoever took this photograph on the left, that is a, a pack rat. But what I have seen, and I'm sure many of you have seen, is the pack rat nest. And you have that one on the right-hand side. And so what you have is a living area, a habitat. And what, you, what the pack rat has done is made sure to be protected, to have all kinds of safeguards, especially choya balls. And there are photographs that I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen them as well, of pack rats actually carrying choya balls in their mouths in order to create this protective layer so that um, species that would uh, want to chase them and to have them as a meal uh, may be facing uh, a kind of, um, well, what should I call it? A gated community. So essentially what we as humans have done in, uh, in Arizona is created gated communities much based on what the pack rat has been doing for millions of years. All right. There are three, let's get into the, the theory of it now. This is when I become even more professorial. There are three fundamental tenets uh, to biomimicry. There is the ethos, reconnect and emulate. The ethos has to do with what, what we value uh, and what Kofi Annan, for example, the UN Secretary General said, what we seek to protect reflects what we value. The citizens of Scottsdale sought to protect the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy or Preserve because we valued it. The state government of Arizona seeks to protect certain lands because these lands are valuable. We value them. The federal government creates national parks because we value them. So what we see, what we value, we tend to protect. So that's the fun, first fundamental ethos of um, biomimicry. The second one is connecting to nature. And this, all of you are doing uh, almost on a daily basis. That's why you, you became steward. That's why you are encouraging people to come out to nature and get a sense with nature. It is amazing how many people do not have the opportunity, or even when they do, um, don't connect on a regular basis to nature. I remember being involved as a steward with the school programs, and we would bring school kids, and many of you were involved with this. I think of Lynn, for example, but there are many more. Um, and they're, they're, they've lived in Arizona. It was their first time going to the desert and learning about, about the desert. So connecting to nature is very important, but I'm preaching to the choir when I'm talking to you about that. And then the last one is emulate, that is learn from nature. Um, Siemens in Germany have created turbine blades now based on the silent flight of the owl. 
I watched a program, I think it was a Nat Geo program not long ago on the owl. And they put an owl in a chamber, um, an, an anechoic chamber, to, to see if they could measure the sound it makes when it flies. And they couldn't pick up any sound at all. It is just amazing that this bird can do that. Well, if we emulate that, then maybe the sound that people dislike about wind turbines will be reduced. Again, biomimicry, learning from nature. So are there lessons that we as human beings on this planet can learn from biomimicry? Yeah, of course there are. But we have to put this in some kind of context and I'm gonna do this by um, compressing time. We're gonna start there. We think that the planet is about 4.5 billion years ago. So we're gonna take that 4.5 billion years and make it into a one year cycle, January the 1st to December 31st. So 365 days. So we're gonna compress 4.5 billion years into 365 days. About 10,000 years ago was the first sign of the agriculture age when people went from, early human beings went from being uh, hunter gatherers to um, an agrarian state where they began to stay in the same place and began to grow a surplus uh, of grains, of, of collection of fruit and things of that nature, of animals and uh, towns were created, and then after that cities and empires, whatever. That in the concept of our 365 days, which is equal to 4.5 billion years, is 30 seconds. It's 30 seconds of time. Think of that, that's not much. If we go to the Industrial Revolution, 18th century, when we began to create a surplus of things, we began to manufacture things in numbers. Up until that point, it was individual. We had craftspeople who made individual things. All of a sudden now we had the first factories that began to make things in large numbers. We're talking about the last two seconds in this 365 days, the last two seconds. So we're not talking about a great deal of time that we've impacted nature, we've impacted the planet to the point that we have. And we're gonna add a little bit of Darwin to this mix. First thing is that, let me make sure that people understand, Darwin never said um, that the, um, uh, it's the strongest that, that uh, survived. That's a, a misinterpretation of his word. Um, what he did say is, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. So it's not gonna be the most powerful that will, that will survive if we're talking about cultures. It's not gonna be the most intelligent that will survive, but the ones that are most adaptable to change. Um, I hear often people talk about, we have to save the planet. No, we don't. The planet will, will go on without us rather nicely. We have to save ourselves. And I'll give you a, a perfect example of that as far as adapting. This is a marine iguana. Marine iguanas only live in the Galapagos Islands. And the Galapagos Islands are about 600 miles offshore, offshore that is of any mainland. They are basically islands, a bit like Hawaii, that were created out of volcanic eruptions. And all of a sudden they rose um, out of the sea. So essentially, if you go to the left side of the picture here, uh, you've got a lot of, of um, what was lava, um, magma, that is now uh, just dark gray rocks. The marine iguana is basically it, it got there because most um, biologists think they got there on some kind of large mats or whatever, it certainly didn't fly. Um, and then it evolved over time and it became dark, one, because it would survive on dark uh, soil because as, as a youngster, 
there are preys, for example, the um, Galapagos hawk will, will uh, seek out the small um, iguanas. But more importantly, it does something that no other iguana does. It actually dives underwater to get reeds. That's how it feeds, because very little grows on most of these Galapagos islands where the marine iguana is found. On the right-hand side of this picture, you see what is called a flightless cormorant. And the flightless cormorant is, is connected genetically to the normal cormorant that flies. But because the food is so plentiful in the Galapagos, it has lost the use of its wings. Over millions of years, the wings have atrophied. It cannot fly anymore. It's closer to being a penguin now than it is a cormorant. And in both cases, these species continue to survive, not because they were the strongest, not because they were the most intelligent, but because they adapted to their environment. And so what we need to do, this is when I get a little bit preachy here, to change from acting as if we are independent from nature. Look at the diagram on the left-hand side. That's the ego diagram. We see ourselves as being on top of this chain of animals and species and we reign supreme to one that we are dependent on nature. We're part of a bigger, larger ecosystem. And we will learn to survive because we can adapt. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, thank you, Jacques. You want to spotlight me, honey? Sure. Thank you. This was awesome. There's so much new stuff. So, um, do you want to stop sharing your screen, um, Jacques, so yeah. that we can see everybody again? We could all be together. Um, and just wondering if anyone has any questions. Although Jacques covered everything so well, and I, I just have to comment on the adaptability stuff because I think we've all changed and learned to adapt a lot in the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, doing things we never thought we could do. Yeah. So uh, yeah. hopefully we've become more adaptable creatures. Good point. I see Sharon there, didn't see her earlier. Hi Sharon. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, um, I- Oh, we have a question from Denise. Denise, okay. your, 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 your mic isn't on. Um, Make it all gallery. Jack? Yes. I just wanted to ask about your point about the bird, uh, the flightless cormorant. You yeah. know, it seems like a, did it adapt or just from lack of use? Is that really an adaptation? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. From what I've, I've learned, because I've, I've been there, I hate to say it, I've been there three times. Uh, it's such a fascinating place. What I learned from the, the biologists I spoke to there was that um, it just, first thing is that it, it, it probably got there because it got blown off course. Mm -hmm. At some point there was a, a flock of cormorants that got blown off course. And remember it's 600 miles from uh, mainland. Mm -hmm. So it can't fly back. It's too far to fly back. So it stayed there. And because it didn't have to fly anywhere, there's so much food there, it just stopped flying. Mm -hmm. And generation after generation, the wings just became useless. So it, it adapted um, to the fact that it can catch its own food there, it doesn't need the wings, so it just it doesn't have them anymore. Mm -hmm. Julie, you have a question? Hi, Jacques, it's Julia. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julia, how are you? I'm good. I have a question. I often talk to people on the trail about the Choya and the lattice work of the, yes. the Choya skeleton. Yes. Uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? Yes. I can. Okay, I've been told recently I might have a microphone problem. There is a little buzz, but it's, it's, not, it's not, no, not a big deal. Okay, so this is kind of next level, but you, you know, we're all nature nerds. <laughs> um, you know, there's certain people um, that like hearing the construction angle of it. So the example of using, you know, rebar as an example is interesting to certain people. And I use, of course, the, the skeleton, the latticework structure of a choya skeleton to explain 
biomimicry as well, but I use it. I thought that we used it and but that it got its strength because of the lattice work. Uh, the webbing was used upright in fencing materials or things and that the strength of it was the structure of the lattice work kind of upright as opposed to the example you gave of how uh, you, your example you gave was you showed the inside of a some special big building that I yeah that had the interior structures yeah what was that building name it's the SC Johnson building okay that probably rings true with a lot of other stewards who were probably from East Coast. But yeah. the example you you used in just now in this talk was a different example of how we buy, you know, of how by how we we incorporate that structure into construction. So do you see the difference I'm asking you about? Am I making sense? I'm having difficulty. I mean, what I'm getting is the fact that you're saying that the, you have examples of, of this last structure being used horizontally. Yes, and also that same lattice type structure. Yeah. But just the other day was pointed out to me that when I was having this conversation with it as a steward, um, talking, being, you know, a little a prodigy of Jacques doing you know talking <laughs> i know talking to someone about it and they said that structure also is now used in casts and on um like casts and medical things yeah I, 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 enforcement I, right yeah um i i don't know about that that example um but i certainly um would see it as being um as credible as as valid um it's creating an internal structure that allows it to do something that otherwise couldn't be done. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a question? All right. Jacques, Fantastic. Thank you so Congrats. much. It was so interesting and so good to see you again. You're always yes. such a gifted teacher. It's just such a pleasure to listen to you. Um, it's so nice to see all of you there. Yeah, really, um, all of us yeah, together, yeah. virtually, but still together. <laughs>